who is the second foreman? Uh, that is apparently Justin. Uh, and with that, we are live. Uh, so welcome to the third joint uh, Foreman and Catello Sprint demo. We've got a solid lineup for today. Um, as always, the current Sprint information and what we're going to demo is always available at the agenda page. Uh, and uh, links to uh, everything is on the uh, event page. So we are going to start with uh, myself uh, showing uh, recent work we've done to allow routing RHSM traffic through ca a capsule. Uh, this is part of an effort to make capsules isolated so that all client traffic can go through a capsule. Uh, and we will see a little more of this later uh, when Steven shows the dispatch router. So to start with, I am going to share my terminal. Actually, I take that back. I'm going to start here. Can you guys see my browser OK? Um, yeah, we can. Uh, as part of this, uh, just to kind of show the setup here, what I have is uh, I have a running uh, production server, I have a capsule, and I will have a client. So three different machines. Um, just to show you, uh, there is uh, Catello CentOS 7 example.com, which is the server, and then the other uh, smart proxy listed here, CentOS 6 capsule, uh, which is the capsule. Um, that we're going to uh, route the traffic through. Um, if you were to uh, go to the content host page, um, it will allow you to um, show, it will show you instructions for how to register and register through an isolated capsule. So if I open up the register page now, um, you'll see that this has changed a little bit, and from this you can select your content source. Uh, right now it is set for the main uh, uh, server, uh, which if I switch it over to the capsule, um, it will give instruct change the host name and give instruction on uh, how to register um, through that particular capsule for you. So that you can just copy paste these commands out and run them. So given that, I will switch over to back to the terminal just so uh, we can kind of do a demo of this, show what's slightly different and kind of prove that it works. So uh, again, I have the server running here where I'm just tailing the production log. I have the capsule server here uh, where I'm tailing the uh, reverse proxy logs. And then I have a client and you can see that I am going to local. I'm going to install the Bootstrap RPM from the capsule, not from the main server, but from the capsule. If we go .conf, uh, we'll see that the host name that RHSM is pointing to is the capsule, and that instead of the typical 443 port, it is pointing at the 8443 port. Uh, which is what the reverse proxy by default is running on. Can run register My password username in the other direction. You see that it says it registers successfully. Uh, we've got output on the production server and then if we look at the reverse proxy logs we'll see that the uh, RHSM traffic hit the uh, reverse proxy um, on its way to the main server um, as some proof that it is not hitting the server directly. It is hitting the capsule and the capsule is proxying the traffic onto the main server, thus allowing clients to interact with the capsule directly. 
um, we could. Look at uh, subscriptions, except there are none to. Do other commands such as listing the available orgs, which again is going to hit the proxy. We can see that it's doing a call for owners, which is essentially the uh, organization call, uh, and also doing some other RGSM calls that it needs to do. And. That is all uh, I have for uh, isolating a client. So again, the big highlights are the Bootstrap RPM is now deployed to the capsules themselves. Clients can install the Bootstrap RPM from a capsule, which will link them to the capsule and route their traffic through the capsule. They can still register to the main server, since there is a capsule running on the main server. Um, are there any questions? Um, as in the past, uh, I will also ask, since I will be around, but other presenters, that since there's a bit of a delay on the YouTube, um, if you'll stick around, we may answer, have to answer questions after um, each different presenter as they potentially come in through the app. All right. Um, next up, we got Tomash. Who's going to talk about compute profiles and NIC integration? Uh, yep, uh, you should be able to see my uh, Chrome at the moment. So, uh, uh, some time ago, we uh, merged the split of primary interface, and that caused the uh, compute profiles uh, or the, um, uh, the interfaces part of compute profiles not working and this print I worked on bringing it back to life uh, so for this demonstration I've got two uh, compute profiles preset for libvirt uh, one is small having uh, two network interfaces uh, medium is the second one having four interfaces so now, when I go to a new host form and select select libvirt, uh, I could can select the compute profile here. But first, I'll go to interfaces to show uh, another small change we did here. We added a small description of the interface below the type column, and it uh, shows a brief info about whether the interface is uh, physical or, or virtual. And in the case of uh, physical interfaces, it adds some details uh, for the uh, specific for the compute uh, provider. So now when I select a small compute profile and go back, you can see that it's uh, created another interface for me. And uh, it was created based on the inform information from the compute profile. Uh, the interfaces are merged uh, from the top down, and uh, the merge is, uh, is applied only on uh, physical interfaces. So when I create a new virtual one and switch the compute profile to medium, you will see that three more are added and the virtual is skipped. Uh, another change we added for the user's convenience is that when, you, when you're when you in the interfaces model window, you can see which uh, compute profile the interface was merged from. And if I cha change anything, uh, the heading disappears. Uh, you could Add more interfaces and uh, if I switch to a small one, uh, only first two are merged and the last one re remains untouched. So that's about that's about it. It's all for the change. Any questions for, from the live presenters? If not, we can go on.
All right, thank you, Tomas. Um, next up, we have Steven to talk about Cupid dispatch routing. Uh, can you push me off further to the end? I had moved myself like way to the end. Oh, I must not have refreshed the page. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, on that case, uh, we'll move on to Daniel uh, to talk about logs with timestamps. Okay, uh, so this is actually just a small contribution from Outlook uh, from the community. Uh, basically, the, just want to go over it very quickly. We've added a timestamp to the logs. Uh, you can see uh, now things like the severity of the log and and the and the date uh, and time. Uh, it's just a small thing. I thought it was uh, good to mention it. Uh, we might, I think, uh, try to move to journal CTL at some point, but uh, Rails 6 and other other um, distributions not used in journal CTL, I think they'll probably, uh, they'll probably have to use this. So that's it. I'll join again for the WPI. All right. Thank you. Uh, next up, we're going to go with Justin to talk about uh, the creation of the Catello SE Linux package. All right. Sorry about that. Um, let me share my screen. That was not the screen I meant to share. But that'll work. Uh, the creation of the Catello SE Linux package. All right. YouTube? No. <laughs> um, let me share my screen. Oh. I don't know. Go, go into something else. Apologies. Uh, having a little technical difficulty from Justin. Um, Let's see. Moving down uh, the list, uh, are you? Do you still need a moment, Stephen? Oh, uh, we should give it a try. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right. Over, Stephen. Talk about dispatch router. Um, so starting in Catello CD2, we have. Um, what we call capsule isolation. So Eric demoed part of it before with the RHSM going through the capsule. Uh, and now what I'll demonstrate is um, you could, uh, or pulps consumer actions like package installation updates to um, what we call the Cupid dispatch router. So it basically sits on the capsule and routes messages um, between the host and the server. Uh, so I can Demonstrate this working by showing you. Um, so this is the controller server. I have it rejecting um, all the communication from my client. It will start. You'll see uh, that uh, Gopher on the agent got the action. Um, it's going to install install the package. Um, there seems to be a problem with 
Python shooting up to 100% CPU usage or so. Um, I think that's fixed in the latest version of Python and Cupid Proton. Uh, I just don't have it here. Um, so it will come back and see. So that's the isolation. Um, if you're curious about more information about how it works, there's documentation um, in the nightly docs on Catilla.org with this diagram. Uh, that's really it. All right, thank you, Stephen. Next, we have David, uh, who's going to uh, talk about some of the Docker, new Docker stuff. David, over to you. Docker feature team for this past sprint. So two of the features that uh, we worked on the Docker feature team for this past sprint were a Docker tags UI page and a new uh, command in the CLI called Docker container uh, for managing containers in Docker. So I'm going to demo both of those. So first let me start off with the Docker tags UI. So for that, the first thing I need to do is create a repository, a Docker repository. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to use BusyBox here. Okay, from Docker Hub. It's actually kind of a big repo, so it might be a little bit slower. And in order to get some tags, I'm going to need, need to sync it. Okay, and let me just check how many images I have and how many tags. And I see here that I have ten images and ten or five Docker tags. Now I can go to the Docker tags page through the content menu. And I can see all the tags for BusyBox. And also, if I had multiple repos, I could filter them. But let me check out the latest tag. So here I can see that, uh, you know, what environment it's in, uh, what image it points to. And I also have a published at field. And this is where I can actually pull the uh, tag if I wanted to. So let me go ahead and drop into a CLI and show how that works. I just give it the URL that I copied, and I pull down the image. Now let me show you the Docker tags page, but for uh, the scenario where I have uh, multiple content views. In order to do that, I need to create a content view. And then I need to add my Docker repository. And now I just need to publish it as my Docker repository. This is going to be the first version. Now, if I go back to the tag page, I view my latest tag. I can see now that it's in the uh, library, it's in the default content view, and it's in the new content view I just created. Now, let me show you also what happens if I promote this content view to an environment. I have three instances of the tag. So let me go ahead and create a new environment off of library. 
I'm just going to call it dev. Now let me promote my content view to fit my new environment. Yeah. And that's promoting. And now if I go back to look at my Docker tag, I can see now it's in the content view. It's in uh, dev now as well. If I wanted to, I could also copy this URL and pull it if I wanted to. So that's pretty much it for the Docker tags page. For the Docker CLI, what we did was we added a new command called container. Here you can see image and tag, which we had already. And now a new container or a new command called container. And I can use it to list out the containers I have. And There's a bunch of different commands under a container. Uh, we're still fixing the API for create, but let's say I wanted to list the info for one of my containers. Do that. Maybe if I want to also check the logs. I haven't started this, so there are no logs. But let me also try maybe to destroy my container. Oh, actually it's delete. And delete my container. And voila. All right, were there any questions? Uh, if not, I'll hang around and answer any that come up. All right, thank you, David. Uh, next, on to more Docker uh, with Daniel to talk about the Docker Container API. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I feel like I'm teetering a little bit here. Uh, just going to expand uh, a bit on how the Hammer extension works. Uh, it's basically um, so we've uh, so it works basically connecting to an API like any other Hammer extension. Uh, if you just uh, append the Docker um, word to to your domain, and then use any sorry, and then use the API v2, uh, you can either select a compute resource in this case compute resource 28, and list the containers there. Uh, if you want to see details about like some of these containers. Here's one uh, container 41. You can do that. Uh, if you uh, want to see the logs, uh, it's also a get operation. That container is off, so it doesn't show anything. Um, I'm not showing it because I thought that uh, it, it would be uh, demoed during the Hammer plugin, but you can send. Uh, Put requests to the power um, to the power route, and that way uh, you can turn off on and on the container. And uh, if you don't want to do this per compute resource, you can also go to uh, sorry, Docker API v2 containers, and you'll get a view of the containers on your former machine. Uh, this one container 171 it's on you see a few of the uh, attributes for the container and uh, like I said it's locked for getting the locks and it, this, this one is just doing pink so these are the locks for the pink command and power uh, put request for power to turn it on turn on turn it off OK, that's it. So uh, if you want to play with it, uh, either read the API doc or there's no one there. That's it. Thank you, Daniel. 
Um, and then next, to continue on with the Docker theme, uh, Partha is going to talk about a few different topics in a row. Uh, building and pulling Docker, provisioning containers with Tele repos, and enabling Docker repos from the Red Hat CDN. Uh, over to you, Partha. All right. Uh, can you guys hear me? Uh, let me get my screen share on. Loud and clear. Let's see. Okay. Uh, let me stop the screen share. Hold on. All right. And you guys see my browser? Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm going to first start with the Docker build stuff. So with Docker, you can actually uh, yeah, with with Docker, you can actually like get a pull an image and make some changes and do a build and create a new Docker image that you can use to like up, upload and use that for other stuff. So here's an example, example docker build file I created. So I have a content view here. Uh, let me show you the content view before. So uh, yeah, I have a content view called CV Scratch, and it's pointing to this, repo to this Scratch repository in Docker Hub. Uh, I got the name of the repository by going to versions, and the Docker uh, versions and the Docker repositories tab under the content view, and from there you can say you can say like from, this is the FQDN you need to provide uh, for Docker to know where to pull it from. So here's the port number, and you can say create me an image based off this image default rec organization dev, CV scratch, whatever, the, the scratch repo, whatever the published repository is. And create me an image based on that so that I can use for containers running them. So let me show you the example here. So here's my Docker build file. Uh, demo doc. So here's the Docker which I And you, you can you can just do a Docker build. And so before I continue, let me show you the images I have here. So this image is not there. The Catello Dev Organization Dev CD. There's no Dev CD Scratch Great Scratch. This this Scratch image is not there amongst the images. I just want to show you that Docker actually pulls it. So, so let me run my command, let me run my uh, uh, build command here. Okay. Right. So, uh, oh yeah. So I create, uh, yeah, I, this is the tag you want to give it. I gave it, I have another one called my demo. I'm just going to create another one. Great demo, sure. So, so this is creating a new Docker image new image that I can use for my newer containers to run and upload this to upload this back to a repository and reuse it elsewhere. I just want to show you that it's using Catello based repos now. So if I did Docker images, you actually see the migrate demo repository. Partha, do you mind bumping your uh, screen up a little? Uh, font? You just want to change the font or? Yeah, just up one size. OK, sorry. Thank you. Is that better? Uh, let me change that. I would say a bit bigger than that. Oh, okay. Uh, let me get get one more slide up. So up here, this uh, more. Is that better? Yeah, that's a bit better. Thanks. Okay, cool. So here you can see the the image I just that I just built using the Docker build command migrate demo, and you can probably now do a Docker run and run with the migrate demo. And you will get you will get whatever the default command does there. So that's stage one. Uh, 
I'm going to show a couple of other things. I will show the CDN enablement for work we did with respect to Docker. And I'm going to show you, and finally, I'm going to show you how to create a Docker container. A container using Catello, images that you just published by Catello. So let's do the CDN stuff first. So uh, currently, the CDN will work only with the stage environment. We don't have, the production part doesn't have the Docker stuff yet. Uh, so I, I did, I went to CDN and I got a manifest with Docker images in it, enabled in them. So, and I, I uploaded it here. Let me, let me go to that page. The connection's a little slow here, but should be, should be too bad. Yeah, yeah, I need the Jeopardy music here to <laughs> keep all entertained, but anyway. Uh, There you go. So I basically uploaded my manifest here, and I had to change the CDN URL. I, you just give it a second and show up. Yeah, to stay CDN stage where I had it gone because it only works for the stage environment. I finally moved a Red Hat repositories page where I can actually enable the Docker repositories that are available. Little slow to show. Uh, just give me one more second. There you go. And here are. Here are the repositories that are available from Red Hat, uh, from the Red Hat CDN. You can select any of these guys. Uh, and once they, once it's enabled, I, I can show you the details and the pulp, via pulp admin to just show point you a couple of things, a couple of important information there. So if you go to like pub admin repo list detail, you should see the last one that I just the repository that I just created. Uh, and here's the feed URL. This is where it's getting the content from. So it's basically going to do a Docker pull registry access stage redhat.com slash rel seven. Uh, that will be the up upstream name, but this, so we create the pulp equivalent so that you can you can then go to the sync page and then sync and sync and publish and use that for your containers. That is the CDN enablement part I wanted to show. You. Uh, next, I'll jump to creating a new container. Uh, so I have a let me show you the in my contributes. I have a content view that I've already created, and it's pointing to the CentOS image of uh, from the Docker Hub. I I synced it and I published it and promoted it. I think David already showed those steps previously, so I'm not going to go through that. So here, yeah, here is an image that has here's a repository that has eight Docker images and 13 Docker tags and all that. So now let's so we want to now create a new container using this. So I'm going to go to the create container page, the new container. Uh, I have multiple, I think new is the good one, I believe. 
So next I select the life cycle environment. Uh, this should show the available content views for that life cycle environment. So center uh, center is there. I select the CentOS repository. And then select any of the tags that are available for the CentOS. And the default capsule has been automatically selected. Now I create image. Give it a default command. Oh, oops. Uh, okay, I have a bad one. Uh, sorry. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, my dev environment is in the middle of something. I'll... So anyway, that that is going to that should create your con container that you can use to do other stuff. Uh, I'm sorry, my development environment is in the middle of two other environments, two other things. Uh, so you, you, yeah, right now you're just going to trust me that the submit will work and you get a new container. Uh, that's pretty much it from on my behalf. Uh, And yeah, so any questions? Uh, we will see if any come in. Thank you, Partha. And lots of good Docker stuff from everyone. Um, up next will be Justin, uh, who is going to stand in place of uh, Walden and myself, who had technical difficulties to show off uh, performing an incremental update. Are you, Justin. I'm sorry. Hopefully, this goes better than last time. Um, so I'm going to show some incremental um, update UI, and uh, currently the the goal to, to use inter incremental updates was just to apply errata to um, systems as quickly as possible and as easy as possible. Um, so you see here I've got two errata that I've selected that are applicable to one system. They're not currently installable, meaning they're not in the content viewer lifecycle environment that the system is in. Um, but I can still click the apply button and I'm presented with the list of systems um, that are applicable if I wanted to only oh, at all. I'm not seeing your screen. Let me try sharing again. Is that any better? Good. Okay. Um, let me go back one screen. Um, so I've selected two errata. They're both applicable to one system but not installable. Um, I'll click apply. If I wanted to only see the systems that were installable, I could um, check this. But currently, I see all systems that are um, that are applicable to this errata, meaning they need this update. Um, I could then check all the systems if I wanted to um, and hit next. And then I see the list of content views um, that will be updated. And you can see, for example, uh, this one will be updated to 1.5. And by default, this just deploys the, the update to the, to the content views, basically performing an incremental update. To go ahead and apply it to all the systems, um, I can just check that box and hit confirm. I'm not going to do that just because it may take um, five minutes or so. But I will show you uh, the task output um, that, that of what it looks like, you basically get taken to the task and, and see it work through 
the progression. And at the end, um, you see all the errata and packages that were copied to each content view version as part of the incremental update. Uh, this is currently not sorted, um, but actually uh, Fix went in just yesterday to sort this to make it a bit more visually appealing and easier to find. Um, and so then if I had clicked um, update, uh, you see version 1.4 is currently in library. We would then see version 1.5 being pushed into library with uh, two additional errata. And I believe that is all for the UI. Um, I will give it back to, or do you mean go ahead and show SE Linux while I'm sharing? Before I give it back to Eric to show CLI, um, I'll show the Catello SE Linux work that Lukash and I uh, did. Thank you, Lukash, for, um, we basically split out the SE Linux policy from Foreman SE Linux into Catello SE Linux so that uh, it could be sort of easier maintained, easier tested uh, by the Catello team. And so you can see here on this is an, uh, CentOS 7 install I just spun up this morning. Uh, it is installed. It's running. Um, and here is the Git repo. Um, and that's really it. Thanks. All right, thank you. Up next, we uh, have Dustin, uh, who's going to show off, uh, uh, hopefully discuss a little of what SAM is, just to refresh her, and then show the SAM installer. Over to hey you, guys. Dustin. Um, so uh, just a reminder what SAM is. It's just a lighter version of Catello um, with uh, some of the features stripped out for just uh, subscription management. and. Uh, if you noticed um, here, if you pull down the latest Catello deploy, uh, the Ruby setup script has this new SAM um, argument. And uh, pass that in, it'll just go ahead and install SAM for you like normal instead of Catello. And um, here's some of the key package differences. So right here you see that uh, the SAM installer has come in instead of the Catello installer. And then we have the hammer. Uh, CLI SAM, which is a uh, drop and replacement for Hammer CLI Catello. Then we have the Catello SAM meta package. And then we have finally the Form SAM plugin that comes in. Um, other key differences for the installer you can see that, uh, um, that uh, instead of requiring the normal uh, Catello meta package, that the SAM, Catello SAM meta package is required. And I uh, see a bug here, but uh, uh, the capsule should not be installed or should not be uh, registered. And um, um, so when, once you're done installing, you should see that SAM's working. You can see that some of the your normal uh, items on the tabs from Catello are gone. Um, you can see like custom, the co custom products are gone from the content um, tab. And that's really much it for me. And, And I'll give it back to you, Eric. All right. Thank you much. And uh, last up uh, will be Shimon with uh, trends and performance. Performance trends, I guess, is really all yours. OK, let's share my screen. You should see the trend screen now. Um, what are trends? Trends are graphs that show the count of hosts for selected parameter grouped by parameters value over time. That's the encyclopedic definition of this. Uh, for example, you can see the, um, yeah, can you see the in my browser? Uh, yeah, we can see it fine. Looks good. Oh. Great. And so here you can see the uh, client version of Puppet and Graph and how it changes over the time. Each uh, 
uh, each area is for a different version. Um, and let's see how it works. This is the new version. You can see it works pretty immediately. You can see that the range is set to 500 days. So it shows a lot of data pretty immediately. This is the older version. I'm running it on a different port on my machine. And I've set it to 100 days. Otherwise, um, three minutes won't be enough. Um, as you can see, it takes a lot of time. Um, what, what was the change? Uh, the change was basically uh, here. Came back. Um, I've changed the way the, um, uh, the trends are stored in the database uh, from uh, storing a snapshot each time the trends task runs which is each 30 minutes. Uh, we move to storing only uh, the interval the, uh, for a single value. So for example, if you had a single host that runs the same version of Puppet for two days, instead of storing 48 lines in the database uh, with, the, with the same value of one, uh, I'll store a single line uh, that will set to interval from two days ago to and two will be new, which means it will be until uh, now. So it reduces a great amount of data in the database uh, and it removes strain from the uh, from the server and from your browser. Uh, I can share a terminal and show you the actual amount of data. For the data that you saw in the older version, there, there is over 1 million of points, but there are something like 400 of intervals in it. So now it, likes, uh, now it runs very smooth. That's all. All right, looks like we have one question for you, uh, and that is, wh what is the y-axis of these graphs? The y-axis of this graph uh, is the number of hosts that actually have uh, this value. So I'll share again my browser. Here it is. Uh, you can see that I have something like 20 machines, less than 20 machines. And it, at the end, most of the machines run the bluish, uh, the bluish version, which is 2.7 probably. Uh, but uh, before it, there were these purple things, 2.723, and other versions. So you can actually see the graph that goes down from the older version and up for the new versions. That's all. Uh, thank you. Thank you to all of our presenters. That concludes our uh, third joint demo. Uh, this, again, information can be found on the current Sprint information page uh, with YouTube links as well as on the event page uh, for all that was presented here. Uh, and that is all. Thank you again.